Well, good morning, everyone. Today's theme is thirst for the Lord. I think that's something we can all relate to. I, have we all been thirsty at some point in time? I think so. So today what I'd like to do is share uh, the scripture from Exodus, and then I'm going to share some comments that were made in our work. And then I'd like to give my own thoughts message. So let's move into chapter 17. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water there for the people. So the world Moses and give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us, our children, and our livestock all die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do? What am I to do with these people? They're ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Walk on ahead of the people, take with you some of the elders, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the denial, and go. I will stand there before you on the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massa and Meribeth because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? You know, last week we talked about being hungry. This week we talked about being thirsty. This sounds to me like the same song, second verse, ought to get better, but it's going to get worse. Well, Two months after the Israelites crossed the Red Sea and began their long journey, they were camped in this wilderness near Mount Sinai. Their food supplies were gone. They were hungry. They complained. In response, God sent quail and manna for them to eat. Now in their journey, there's no water. They're thirsty. They're grumbling. Moses even became irritated. He asked them, why are they testing the Lord? They continued to complain and make accusations against him. Moses usually prayed patiently for the people. But this time, Moses complained to God about the accusations of his people. But he did follow God's instructions. He went before the people with his staff to Mount Horeb. When he struck the rock, Water came forth just as God stood on the rock and was present there with them. Now, the area around Mount Horeb has springs below the limestone rock that is there. One area called Massa means test, and the other area called Merba means quarrel to commemorate the way the Israelites quarreled with Moses and received water from there. The writer of Exodus presents the generations of Israelites in the wilderness in the worst possible light. People who are starving, dying of thirst, those people would naturally cry out to God. Those whose future is uncertain naturally would despair and second-guess decisions they've made. Where is the line between negativity and legitimate concern? In today's world, grumbling and complaining are everywhere. People of faith often have as many complaints as those who do not know God. Yet God continues to bear patiently humankind. God is present even Spare, such is the grace of God. So, 
So what can we encounter? Are there events in our life that reflect our own wilderness journey? When are we going to get back to church building? When are we going to stop getting sick? When can I go visit my friends, my grandkids, my family? How come I have to do all my class work on this computer and do all my stuff online? Why can't I go talk with my teacher and my friends? Why can't I go play with people? Why can't I hug people? We're in a nation, a society right now where we're having complaints and we're just a complaining kind of people. So what are we gonna do about it? So I'm thinking about, are there alternatives to our complaining? I feel like action. Be about doing what you can do instead of complaining about what you can't. Moses went to the rock with God and he struck the rock and he made things happen. And they did receive water. A motto that I have tried in my life is seek and you shall find knock and with Jesus promised the comforter and we walk on our life's journey he really is on the present. I think the 23rd Psalm kind of sums up some of my thoughts about the Lord always being present with you. And so I'd like to share that. I know you're familiar with it and can probably say it along with me. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no fear, no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We do have the promises of God to always be when you face a situation that is causing you stress, do you visualize this situation as a glass that is half or as a glass that is half empty? I think we have a choice. And when we face these struggles in life, we often petition God for help, for direction. Do we also petition God when we are being blessed and when things are going good? We are a blessed people. I'd like to share a memory with you uh, from uh, a lot of conversations that I had with John Schneider through the years. And if you go to church anytime soon, you'll notice a new tree planted to the left of the walk as you come in. And that is going to be called Big John Tree by me. And it is uh, a donation by the family for uh, his memory. And uh, so you can think of Big John whenever you go to the church from now on. But we had a lot of conversations through the years and it was always started out like, well, step into my office. And that was just a way of John and I communicating to each other that we had a concern that we wanted to share with each other and get some advice and direction. And we would talk and, and lots of times, you know, out in the yard or on the patio or wherever we were about things. But the end result uh, many, many times from John to me was, you know, we really are a blessed family. We are really a blessed family by God for everything that we are able to do. And I think of that relationship that I had with him and the fact that we are so blessed. 
your attitude really does affect your altitude and it affects the outcomes of the challenges that you face in your life and i think that we just need to keep those kinds of things in mind as we go through the living of our life every day well as an ex-coach now as a retired person i still have to relate back to my coaching days so i'd like to share just a, a coaching example from you about attitude you know as as a uh, end of practice drill we did a lot of conditioning and one of my favorite conditioning drills or line drills sometimes people would call them suicides uh, where you run a short distance back of half court back quarters court back and just it's a it's a good conditioning bill and we put it on a clock and then had to get it done in a certain time or we'd do it again but then I also had this idea I came up with and just say, after we ran one, I'd ask the team, do you want to do it again? Well, if the answer was yes, then we were done. But if somebody complained or said, no, no, guess what? We got to run another one. And they quickly learned that attitude was so important about, yes, we want to do it again. And that then I think affected the attitude of that, uh, that team and, and became uh, uh, a real positive thing for, for all my teams as we worked on attitude for uh, conditioning and those kinds of things. A second coaching example, you know that coaches always complain about the officials. And so they stand on the side, they rant and they rave and they oh, all right, and call them names or whatever. And it really uh, affects how things go, but it's kind of one of those things you just say, oh, well, he's a coach, that's what he's supposed to do. Well, I, as a pretty, fairly competitive person uh, through, through a lot of my years, uh, did my share of complaining to officials. I had an official one time come by me during a, a free throw where they normally stand by the coach when I'm, so they can kind of communicate a little bit. He said, you know, coach, you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. And I've thought about that a lot of times, and I think it affected how I communicated with officials through the years. Late in my career, I had some officials, it's more than one actually, uh, communicate with me. And their comment was, you know, coach, we know that if you're talking to us, we should listen because you're not just complaining, you're trying to raise some area that we need to address. And I always took that as a very positive comment that they recognized that, that I was trying to just uh, get them to think about something rather than complaining about what was going on. And most of you know that I ran into an official while I was skiing on a ski lift of all places in Park City, Utah. And we have skied together ever since that time, every year, uh, you know, we meet someplace on some mountain and ski for a while. But he is one of those, those uh, officials that, that made that comment to me. And I always remember him and, and thank him for that. But we've had a great relationship now doing other activities together. Attitude really does affect the altitude that we have. Our complaints, well, yes, if they can be expressed as concerned, that's fine. But understand that God really is always with you. And he is walking with you. And he has given us the promise of his spirit of always being there. So then, do you find God on your wilderness journey? No, he is there. The rocks or the bumps in the road are simply challenges for us to overcome as we continue on our journey. Remember the phrase, that without the rocks in the stream or the riverbed, the stream would have no song that it sings. In closing, I'd like to share some words from a hymn. My life flows on in England's song. Later on, we will hear a group saying this, so I'd like you to really focus in on the words uh, as they do that. But my life flows on in endless song, above earth's lamentations, I hear the real though far off hymn that hails a new creation. 
through all the tumult and strife, I hear that music's ringing. It sounds and it echoes in my soul. How can I keep from singing? The peace of Christ makes fresh my heart, a fountain ever springing. All things are mine since I am his. How can I keep from singing? No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love is Lord of heaven and of earth, how can I keep from singing? May the love of Christ go with you throughout this week.